Amen. In Luke chapter 16 this morning, I want you to read verse number 10 and 11 with me. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? There's a few things happening in this verse. He's contrasting being faithful and being unjust. He's contrasting the little things and the big things. And if you begin to read this at the first and then look at the last in verse number 11, he basically says if you're faithful in the little things, then you will have true riches. What I want to do is connect some dots for you this morning, and uh, maybe you could call this sermon, How to Be a Spiritual Millionaire. We all need money. I often say money isn't everything. But I have discovered that it's right up there with oxygen. You kind of need it to live and survive. And I wish that I could say that I'm above that, and I never worry about money, and I never think about money. But frankly, God has put us here to work, and to earn, and to provide, and having safety and security, and even some of the conveniences of life. This is a huge blessing that God gives us. But our focus while we're here is not about money. That's not the true riches. I could show you what riches are so that maybe we could learn what the true riches are. Frankly, the true riches are souls or blessings from God. Don't you want it to be said when you meet your Lord that you have true riches in heaven that no one can take away from you? Don't you want to be a spiritual millionaire if that's what God has available for you? Wouldn't you want to uh, be able to take advantage of such an opportunity that God has provided for you? In this verse, though, he talks about doing the little things and doing the big things. And what he's saying is your habits, your personality type, your faithfulness, if you're faithful in doing the little things, then we know that you're someone that can be trusted to take care of the big things. And if you catch somebody that's dishonest and just in those little things, you can mark it down until they learn better. They're probably going to be unfaithful in the big things as well. To be faithful means you are in the place you're supposed to be doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing and you're doing it for God's glory. God is always faithful, and if we're called after His name, we ought to be faithful as well. A few uh, synonyms with faithful would be fidelity, fidelity, or consistency, or dependability. Somebody can trust you, their trustworthiness, obedience, reliability. Like clock clockwork, you can know that they'll be where they're supposed to be on time and do what they're supposed to do. You can count on them. So God wants us as Christians to be a good example of someone that is faithful, trustworthy, dependable, reliable. That ought to be your reputation. When people speak about you, there are certain things they can say, well, I know one thing. I've used the example before that if somebody were ever to rob our house, they know for a fact that on Sunday morning, nobody's home. They can rob our house. That's the time to do it, right? If you're going to break and enter, you know, and steal my nickels, I ain't got that many, but you know, <laughs> that's the time to do it because you know I'm going to be in the house of the Lord. God wants us to be faithful. In 1 Corinthians 4, he says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Found faithful, discovered, like, ha ha, look at this guy. He's faithful, dependable, reliable, trustworthy. He gives us this example, and this is a life lesson. He says, he, look at it again with me in verse 10, he that is faithful in that which is least, that's the little things, is faithful also in much, that's the big things. 
And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? You know, mammon is often used as money or stuff, possessions, things. If you can't be trusted with some real basic resources on this earth, especially when they belong to somebody else, why would anybody ever want to give you true riches? We ought to have a good reputation with those that are without, those that are outside of the church. It ought to be, hey, they are dependable, reliable, trustworthy, honest. I know that I'm, you know, if I, if I left my wallet in their car and I left, I know that it's safe in their care. I can trust them. I can count on them to do the right thing. There's this concept in investing. They call it compound interest. You guys know what I'm talking about? So this is the concept of a, the spiritual com, compound effect. I need true riches in heaven, and if I invest a little bit every single day, well then I know that my spiritual riches will continue to grow. God wants us faithful in the little things. Now, now I want some audience participation here. I need your help. What are some of the little things that we as human beings, as Christians, that we can get better at? What are some of the little daily things that we need to be consistent at? Be on time. To be on time. Ooh, being punctual. Ouch. Pray. Praying. Praying without ceasing. What else are the little things that we need to work on? What would you say, brother? Reading your, you know, so we, we put that in the bulletin. I encourage you to read your daily proverb because that's a great starting point. And listen, hey, I, I understand that, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. And we always, seems like we have more things to do than we have hours. And, you know, but are, are you faithfully searching for the Word of God every day? That's a little thing, believe it or not. But if you do a little bit here and a little bit tomorrow and a little bit the next day, it'll have this huge growth effect on your life. Your spiritual growth will be massive. It, I mean, read the Bible or listen to the Bible while you're driving. Listen to some preaching. Find some way to get God's Word in your heart. We sing the psalm songs where you can listen to the psalms and uh, many other verses that are sung and then all of a sudden you're committing it to memory and you catch yourself singing those things. We need to do the small things. Do the little things. If you said, you know, it's been winter, and you know what happens during winter time? We, we hibernate. We think we're all polar bears or something, right? We eat a bunch of seals, and then we, then we stay inside, and we hide. Now, I praise the Lord for the beautiful weather we have, and it's kind of like I've been kind of slow moving, and I'm waking up out of this hibernation. i got to get rid of a little bit of weight, and i got to change some habits. I need some exercise. Well, now, So if you say, I, I want to be built. I want to be able to do 200 push-ups. When I say, okay, come down here and start right now. You say, no way, I'd embarrass myself. I'd fall flat. Okay, well, how about this? Maybe if you did 10. And then maybe in another hour you did 10. If I asked you, if I said, and, and Brother Luke, don't answer, all right? Uh, but if I asked some of you, you know, how many push-ups can you do? What's the most you think you could do? Pax, I'm going to put you on the spot, buddy. He was my soul winning partner yesterday. Pax, how many push-ups do you think you can do? Four. Four. <laughs> I appreciate his humility and his honesty, okay? That'll go a long way in life. Now, Pax, is for all of the push-ups that you can do? Probably. But now, wait a minute. If I got you up here and you did your four, and then you waited five minutes, do you think you could do four more? Maybe. What if it was ten minutes? Guys, what I'm getting at here is if we can make small moves, small decisions, small changes in the direction that we want to go, that God can begin to have a huge blessing in our life and help us to grow spiritually. In the stock market or in investing, you know, that's the difference between savings is you just hold your nickel in the bank or hold it in your pocket. Investing is I'm going to put it to something that will grow because I need to increase my money. I, when I get to the end of my life, I don't want to just say these are the nickels I put in my jar. Because that's not going to help because if you, you know, <laughs> inflation is catching up with our nickels, isn't it? So instead, we need our nickel to grow into a dime, and then that way it's worth our while. There's this chart in investing, and I, I, I printed it out to give you this little example. This is the 
compound effect in interest. And uh, it, there's two different people represented here. One guy is given $10 a day plus 10% weekly growth. He's increasing every week. He grows a little bit more every week. The other guy just gets $5,000 a month. Now, who wants $5,000 a month? Amen. Yeah, my girls do. They're greedy. All right. $5,000 a month. Amen. That'll do, right? But what if I said, I'm going to give you $10 a day, plus it will increase by 10% every week if you're growing. Well, after the end of the first month, you'd have $51. The other guy would have $5,000. And he'd be looking at you saying, you made the wrong decision. Ha ha. Right? It goes on. All right? Well, month number two, you're at $126. He's at 10 grand. Month three, $235. He's at 15 grand. Now, don't get discouraged when you're doing the little things and you look and you're like, I don't have any fruit. Oh, man, I'm trying to grow in this area of my life and I know what I need to do. I, I need to do the push ups or I need to change my habit or I need to learn this or memorize that or I need to do something different. Now, I want you to keep connecting the dots in spiritual growth here because this is what we're talking about. Jesus said, if you're faithful in the little things, then we know you'll be faithful in the big things. And if you're faithful in the little things, you'll get the, the true riches, which are God's blessings on your life. When you get to month 12, at the end of that first year, you've got $15,541, while your buddy made 60 grand. Big difference. However, you continue it out. It doesn't take long. Month 17, you're at $127,000. He's only at $85,000. I'm talking about making small moves in investments with your time to grow. Jesus said, do the little things. Be faithful in the least. At the end of that second year, you've got over $2 million. The other guy has $120,000. This is a, a money example because Jesus is using money and stewardship and poverty to wake us up to what really matters in life. And it's not how much money is in your pocket or your bank account. It's are you rich toward God? Have you been found faithful as a steward of God? Because here's the thing. God has given you great blessings. If I asked you to take out a sheet of paper and start writing down the things that you're thankful that God has given you, you better recognize that you have the ability to see and hear and talk and walk and breathe and love, and have family, and have friends, and you can understand the Bible, you can thank Him for His salvation, that He's forgiven your sin. Like, we could come up with an enormous list of things. Uh, now, just out of curiosity, who had a roof over their head last night while they slept? Wow. God's really been good to you. Who had air conditioning last night? How come Miss Norma Jean's not raising her hand? <laughs> She said, ooh, it's cool in here. Her air conditioner went down. She said, I'm going to sleep here tonight. I said, all right. Just don't sleep while I'm preaching, all right? <laughs> I want you to go to Genesis 1. I want you to see something. I want to share some things with you guys. I want to show you that it's God's will that we would continuously grow. And if we'll make the effort to begin doing these little things, the least things, as he said, then we can ultimately have great spiritual growth. Uh, listen, if I, if I said, I need to lose 20 pounds, it's not going to happen today. It just can't happen. Yeah, I take my shoes off and everything, and I still am not enough, right? Well, I've just got to change a few habits every day, be consistent, do a little more moving around, right? Whatever it is, and now that's physical, but let's talk about the spiritual riches. How can I grow spiritually? Well, you start with your daily proverb. You start with reading a chapter every day somewhere else. Maybe you get to the point where you're reading the Bible a whole hour a day, reading like 10, 12 chapters. That's growth. Because then a year from now, you're going to begin to see these exponential gains and growth in your life because you've worked little by little to do the little things and you've created healthy habits that really change who you are. You become known as somebody that's faithful. We need spiritual blessings. We need riches from God. We need His wisdom and His gifts. I want you to understand something about God. You're in Genesis 1. Look at Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. This goes to our identity, but let's look at who God is. It tells us in the first five words in the Bible, in the beginning God created. Here's something you need to know about God. He is a doer. He is a worker. 
He is making and designing and building. That's what He does. From the very beginning, the first thing He does was He starts to create. Now, are we made in God's image? Yes. Yeah, in fact, go to verse 26 in this chapter. Look at verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So he says, first let's make them like us, to look like us, to be like us. So did that mean God created you to be a creator, to be a builder, to be a doer, to be a worker? Right? But then right away, because God has the authority, He then gives us authority. He says, and give man dominion. Give them leadership and authority and the power to rule over the things that He made. Stewardship is what we would call this. Everything that you have within reach of your hand is something that God has given you for stewardship purposes. Are you faithful in the least things? You know, this is why... God tells us to tithe. Tithing means tenth. How much of your money belongs to you? How much? Zero. None of it. How much of your money belongs to God? All, All right, and He sees your checkbook and He says, hey, why don't you give it back to me? Now, I've had people in the past, they said, well, listen, I'm in a church and I don't agree with everything and I think they're doing things wrong and do I still have to give money? And I said, well, I think that God wants us to give giving it to Him, not giving it to them. When you give money, you're not, it's not for me. It's for the Lord. It's for His work. And, you know, I don't talk about money a lot because I've seen a lot of problems in churches with money, and God forbid we would ever have that. I pray that in our church we would be wise stewards of what God has given us, and we can be faithful with every penny, every cent, that we can be faithful in the little things, the least things. And God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you some money. Let's say He gives you $100. And it's a test. Because if you start saying, I got this $100, I can't share it with somebody else, or God forbid if I gave it to God. Listen, one of the best things you can do as a young believer is whatever you earn, you give it back to God. One of the best things you can do as a young couple, you want, you want to be built on the foundation of God, instead of saying, well, I want a house like mom and dad have, and I want to drive a new car like mom and dad have, why don't you get in the habit of committing your riches to the Lord, 100% of it, and if he said give 10%, you do it. If he said, I wanted 20, you should do that. But he didn't. Oh, he's not like Uncle Sam who wants to keep notching that number up, you know, I'm going to take a little more here and a little more there. And, oh, you did this? Well, we'll take a tax on that. I mean, oh, boy, Uncle Sam tries to get everything he can. God says, I'm going to give you, I'm going to test you, and I'm going to try you to see what you'll do with what I give you. Notice he gives man power. Look at verse 27. He says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Right? There's not a hundred genders. Uh, verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. Now here God says, I want you to increase. I, I'm giving you your body as a steward, not so you can enjoy your body with whatever you want to do, but so that you can make somebody else. The next thing God does is He makes you a family. He gives you the power to reproduce, but He gives you a commandment. This is the first commandment in the Bible to Adam and Eve, and it's reproduce yourself. Have a family. Make more. Right? So He gives him the power to be a leader. He gives him the power to have a family. Look what else he says. God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish. Notice he says, subdue, dominion. God wants you to rule well in whatever area of life he's given you stewardship. God, wants, God has given you the power to be a leader, and he wants you to do it well. Sometimes we lead in serving others, don't we? Sometimes we subdue by keeping the dog out of the chickens, right? Brother Larry got me the other day. He was heading to the house, and he said, well, it looks like I'll beat you there. I said, okay, when you get there, just feed the dog. And he said, feed it a chicken. <laughs> go, to, go to chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, look at verse 15. And God, and the Lord God took the man 
and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. I want you to notice this, that right away God makes man and he says, now get to work. Isn't the American dream? Boy, if I could just hit the lotto or have some get-rich-quick scheme and I can just sit back and be at ease and not have to do a thing. Man, let me tell you something. You're in your prime when you're using your hands that God's given you in the skill and the knowledge and the wisdom that God's given you to work. And you say, yeah, but you don't understand my trade, Brother Fanning. You don't know what I do. No, here's what I know. You work, you make, you build, you design, you think, you lead, you create just like God. We're made in His image. We're made to work. This is one of the blessings He's given us. So be a good steward over your hands and your mind and your work and do it to the best of your ability for God's glory. Look, He says in, he says in verse 15, I put Him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. You know God made Adam a gardener? If we went around the room and I said, tell me your occupation and tell me what you've done and tell me about your business and tell me about all the wonderful things you do. If anybody says, oh, I'm just a gardener, in today's culture and economy, they'd probably say, Pfft. when are you going to get serious with life, right? You know what's interesting, though, about gardening? Let's say you're a wage slave. You're a slave to debt, and you, you're a punch in the nine to five or seven to six. Some of us, right? you know, I, I get up early and I come home late and I'm working all the time. I'm like a servant. I'm like a slave. How do I get out of debt? You know, God's given you seed and soil and sunshine, sunshine and rain, and you can actually start planting a garden, and you could actually get yourself out of debt with growing garden things. Did you? I mean, think about this. God's given you the ability to produce millions of dollars with the ground. Most of us won't do the little things of planting those seeds, will we? We have good excuses. We don't have the time. We don't have the resources. I don't see myself as a gardener. Well, God saw us as a gardener when He made Adam, didn't He? Look what He says in, uh, in verse 15. Again, He says, Put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely. God gave him freedom in that. Freedom is a gift from God. Verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Here God gives him a warning about evil. There's a warning about sin. Adam knew about good. He saw what God made and God said it was good. He saw the woman. He said it was very good. Adam knew about good, but what he didn't know was evil. And there was a warning from God, don't go the wrong way. You'll find out real quick it's a mistake. If you would go to 2 Kings 22. I want to talk about being a wise steward, about doing the little things for God's glory. In Numbers chapter 12, he tells us of Moses. It says, My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. God looked at Moses and he said, This guy is faithful. I can trust him. I can count on him. He, God said, With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches, and in the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore, when were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? God makes this point. Moses is faithful. I see his heart. I'm going to talk with him face to face, not mysteriously, because I want him to talk to you on my behalf. Now, we ought to be that type of a faithful messenger. You're a Christian. You've trusted Christ for salvation. The Holy Spirit of promise has moved into you. You are sealed unto the day of redemption. And now He wants to use you and speak through you. But the problem is, He doesn't want us to be a hypocrite when we talk about Jesus. He wants us to be faithful. You're in 2 Kings 22, if you would find verse number 5. And let them delivered into the hand of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord, and let them give it to the doers of the work, which is in the house of the Lord, to repair the breaches of the house, unto the carpenters and builders and masers, and to buy timber of hewn stone and repair the house. Howbeit there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered into their hand, because they dealt faithfully. Notice it says there was no reckoning. Now, I know we're in the South and people, I reckon I will. But that, that's actually a very proper accounting term. A reconciliation of the account. I gave you $10. What did you do with the $10? 
We would call it like a financial audit. Well, we're going to be audited by the Lord in the end of our life. And he says, I've given you talents and abilities and opportunities, yea, and I even gave you people as an opportunity to minister to that person. How did you manage them? How did you minister to them? Were you faithful? These men had such a great reputation. He said, we know who they are and what they're doing. We don't have to account with them. I'm thankful we have some men in the building like that where there's been needs of certain things and it's kind of like, I don't, I don't have to, you don't have to call it in and get approval to buy something we need. There have been things that have had to be repaired around here and in the plumbing and air conditioning and doors and little things and it's like, and, and there's certain, it's just like, spend what needs to be spent and do it right. We don't always have to have a reckoning, and that's the type of Christian that we ought to be with God, is where we don't have to give account for every dollar, but I want you to connect it with your time. What do you do with your time? What do you enjoy doing with your time? Guys, you understand time is literally the most valuable resource that you have on earth, right? Time is more valuable than money. I can spend my money, and I can get it back. When I waste my time, I will never get it back. What do you do with your time when you're at church? Are you reading the Bible? Are you asking God to help me to grow? Or are you just waiting, oh, I can't wait to get out of here so I can talk to my friends on the internet again? I, oh, I wonder what time the buffet opens. I've got to get out of here. What are you doing with your time? Are you investing it? Go to Psalm 12, please. Go to Psalm chapter 12. There was a man, Nehemiah spoke, it said, Then I gave my brother Hananiah, and Hananiah, the ruler of the, of the palace, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and feared God above many. Would it be said of you that you are a faithful person and that you walk in the fear of the Lord? God's will is while we're here with every time that we have, not that we would waste time or kill time, but that we would invest. What are you doing with the little things in your life? Most of us probably have some bad habits with our time. And if we could fix our bad habits in our time, we could achieve the goals we have for spiritual success. Hey, do you want to be a spiritual millionaire? Well, it takes day by day, little by little, investing your times in the thing of the Lord. Uh, Pax, would you get me one of those uh, memory verse lists off the back in there, please, sir? You're in Psalm chapter 12. Let's look at verse number 1. Psalm 12, verse 1. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of man. He's crying out in a time, and he says, you don't know what it's like today in culture. Nobody's faithful like they should be. Look at verse 2. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and with a double heart do they speak. I mean, this is... You know, I mean, we talk about football, we talk about the size of houses, and we talk about sports cars. And look, if you like football, I'm not picking on you. But the point is, we live in a time where our culture is based on vain, worthless, empty, pointless things. Things that have no eternal value. None whatsoever. Go to Psalm 101. Go to Psalm 101. We passed these out this year, or last year. And these, we call this our soul winner's scriptural arsenal, right? If, if we're going out and we're doing battle against the devil by preaching the gospel, there are certain verses that if you add it to your memory, it will, it will sharpen your sword as you go out to preach the gospel. These are on the back. I want everybody to take one if you didn't get one. Uh, some of you already have. Some, some people in here have all of these memorized. Though this came from a sermon I did a while ago, a soul winning school where I had uh, three by five cards, and I, I and I encouraged everybody. You know, I, I printed them, but I would encourage you to write it out for yourself. Get a deck of three by five cards; they're like a couple bucks. They're not very expensive. Handwrite the verses out, carry it with you every week. Add a new one, have it memorized, and then you can start shuffling through these. And then you can have verses memorized so that at a moment's notice when somebody says something about salvation, heaven, hell, even if somebody uses God's name in vain, oh, Jesus, I'll say, what does he have to do with it? Hey, by the way, is heaven your home? They didn't mean that when they used his name, but I sure like to flip it on them and kind of startle them a little bit. 
If you had these verses committed to memory, you would be able to preach the gospel to anybody, anywhere, at a moment's notice. Now here's the thing. Is there anybody in here that could confidently say, I can memorize this whole sheet of verses today? I don't believe there's anyone in here that is incapable of learning these over the next year. Every one of you has the ability to do it. The question is, do you value this? Do you value the things of the Lord? Is that a priority to you? Do you want to be able to have God's Word committed to your heart so you can share it with others? In Psalm 89, he says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. We sing this, right? With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. Now, I want to ask you, if we're made in the image of God and we're called to be like God, are you demonstrating mercy to others? Are you faithful to others? It's easy to say one thing. Are you merciful? Are you faithful? Or are you a hypocrite? We had an opportunity last night. Uh, Brother Johannes and I went for a burger. And as we're leaving, this lady was at the restaurant and she asked for help. Now, at first, I'm like, is this a scam? Is she trying to get it? Where's my wallet? Right? She said, do you know how to get into a car? <laughs> well, that's kind of a trick question, you know. Her, uh, and I don't know if they were married, I didn't, I didn't get that far, but anyway, we went over and he was trying to get into the car. He had locked his keys in. They were stuck. They were stranded. And um, I, I pulled out my pocket knife, and I got a big old pocket knife the kids bought me, and I started telling him that. So I'm prying his car door, and it wasn't enough. And so I went back to my truck, and I got a machete. And so I got a machete and a pocket knife. We're prying this guy's door. And so, I'm, so he's like, so you're a pastor. Because I said, the kids bought, the church bought this for me. And I, I said, oh, yeah, some kids at church got this. They said, I need a big knife, right? And, oh, you're a pastor. Okay. I said, yeah, are you a Christian? Well, I'm, I'm a, a black Hebrew Israelite. It's called a black Hebrew Israelite. If you're not familiar with them, they believe that in the Bible that black people are God's chosen people. It is a very racist and somewhat militant organization. Um, some of them are very dangerous. The last time I spoke to a black Hebrew Israelite, we had some very heated words. Very heated. And so I'm holding a machete and a pocket knife, and I just look at it and say, well, we would probably disagree on some things. <laughs> I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. I will sing. Now, am I supposed to show this guy mercy? Well, now, wait a minute. I have more scriptural knowledge than him, and I know that he's in error. I can prove that he's a heretic. I can use the Bible, and I could have whipped him across the park. He thinks he's a Sabbath keeper, and he's going to get to heaven by that. He thinks that God is a racist, and he picks one person, and they're special. Oh, man, I had verses lined up for this guy. And yet God used this opportunity, Brother Johannes and I, in a very humble, loving way to just tell him the truth. I didn't have to show him mercy. Oh, he's of a false religion? <laughs> I'm taking my stuff and going home. Good luck. Call AAA, right? Shouldn't I show him mercy? God's shown me mercy. Shouldn't I continue to be faithful? It was an amazing opportunity. It took a lot to finally get it to happen, but right at the moment, I, I just, by habit, by instinct, God help me. And then it popped open. And I said, Praise the Lord. Now, he doesn't believe in Jesus. He doesn't believe that Jesus is God. He doesn't believe that faith alone in Jesus Christ, that, that we trust in His finished works. For this guy believes, I have to keep the Sabbath and eat a certain way, and i got to dress a certain way. Like, all of the law was put on him by somebody else, and that's how you show that you're righteous. He's confused. And out of love, we showed some mercy. We showed some faithfulness. And even afterwards, he chased us down in the parking lot. Hey, man, let me give you some money. Let me, you have cash out. And I said, I didn't know what to say at first. I just, I said, Jesus. I said, praise Jesus. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Keep it. I don't want your money. 
But I wanted him to know that uh, there is a God in heaven and His name is Jesus and that faith in Him, it changes things. And God gave me the power with my hands to, if you will, work a miracle and open this guy's door in a way he didn't have the power. And I'm thankful that God used me to show some mercy to somebody that doesn't deserve it. When's the last time you you've spoke to a black Hebrew Israelite and you had a machete in your hand and a pocket knife <laughs> and things went down very peacefully? I can't take any credit. I've got to give God the glory. Guys, you're in Psalm 101. I want you to see this. Look at verse number 3. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Now, I want you to understand this is David saying, in my house, we're going to do it the right way. I'm going to kick out the evil. I like to make an application with television. When all that filth comes on, man, you better turn the channel, whether it's on your phone or on the wall, get rid of it. Don't put it in front of your eyes. He says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor. Now here he's talking about gossiping. Guys, when somebody comes gossiping, we need to walk away. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart will I not suffer. Finally, look at this, verse 6. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. David made the point, I don't want servants in my house that have another God. If you're going to work with me, we're going to work for God, and we're going to do it together. Notice he says, Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land. It was said of David that his heart was like God's heart. And when God looks down at you, does he say, Now that man is faithful, walking in the fear of the Lord. This lady is truly faithful to me. If you would, go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. In Proverbs 20 it says, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Most people will say, hey, I'm pretty good, but truly, who can find somebody that's reliable that you can count on? I've had many a people say, hey, preacher, I'm coming to church tomorrow. I say, you wouldn't lie to a preacher, would you? And I've had many a people, oh, no! And then they never show up. They never show up. It breaks my heart. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. That's what the single ladies are saying. A faithful man who can find, right? <laughs> Can't find a, who can find a virtuous woman, right? Listen, guys, what we're talking about is how to be a spiritual millionaire. How to truly be blessed by God and have His hand of blessing all over your life. Uh, it's what we do with the little things, our time, our talent, and our treasure. What are you doing with the little things? Because then God can say, okay, you can be trusted with a little bit of stuff. Now I'm going to give you a lot of stuff. You're in Matthew chapter 6. Look at verse number 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What do you value the most? What do you value the most? Is it your phone? Is it your laptop? I, I really value my laptop. It's an old one, but it's my laptop, and I use it. I'm a computer guy. I use it all the time. But frankly, if somebody broke in my house and they took my Bible, I'd probably be more upset if they took this Bible than if they took my laptop. This one means a lot to me. How do you, where is your treasure? What bothers you when you can't have it? Go to Matthew 24. Move forward a little bit to Matthew 24. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If your treasure is, wow, look at that. I, God just gave me a bunch of money. I better hold on to it. Or do you say, wait a minute, maybe God gave it to me to be a steward and do His work. I mean, if, you, if, a, if a winning lottery ticket flies across the parking lot and hits you in the face, maybe the Lord has chosen you because He's found you faithful to preach the gospel, to buy Bibles. Who knows, right? 
Matthew 24, look at this in verse 45. Go to the end of the chapter, verse number 45. Who then is a faithful and wise steward? All right, this is the goal. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his house to give them meat in due season? I want to point this out. God gives to one person so that they can give meat to the others. The household needs meat. And he says, who can I trust to give this, this money to so they can feed others on my behalf? Isn't that how Abraham was? Abraham was a millionaire, not just spiritually, but physically. And God gave him millions, and Abraham took care of his house. He trained them how to fight, but he also trained them spiritually how to serve the Lord. He says in verse 46, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. When God shows up and he sees that you've been working all along, when your time is up on earth and you stand before the Lord and he sees that you've been working all along, he says, I'm going to make you a ruler one day. Go to Acts chapter 6. I want to give you this same concept that God is looking for somebody to be a wise steward. Are you faithful in the little things? What are the little things in your life that if you changed now, it would literally help you to become a spiritual millionaire? Where it would take care of all of the goals and the accomplishments you want to do for the Lord? Because I really believe God has specifically given you talents and gifts and abilities and a comprehension just to do the work that He wants you to do. It's perfectly fitted for you. He's given you everything that you need. The question is, what are you doing with the little things, with the time that you have? In Acts chapter 6, look at verse number 1. In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring among the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Uh, this is racism playing itself out in the church where the Grecians were not being provided for, but the Hebrews were. Verse 2, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. He says, It's not a good thing if I have to stop preaching the Gospel and go and take care of the daily ministration. I also need to point out when it says serve tables here, that is not talking about being a waiter and making bread and feeding people. Many people awful, often preach that, that. They're talking about giving away food, but it's the tables of the money changers is the same word that's used here. The bank, this word is also interpreted in your King James Bible as a bank. You go to the bank teller and there's a table and they count money. He says, money was donated to the church to feed the widows and they were being selective. We'll give some to the Hebrew widows, but we're not going to give any money to the Greek he, uh, widows. You follow what's happening here? So when it says serve tables, it's not talking about bread, it's talking about money. And the men that were in charge that were out preaching the gospel and evangelizing, they said, we need some help. I don't want to deal with the money. I just want to preach the gospel. We need some faithful men. Look at verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business... But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the Word. He says, get somebody to handle the money, and we're going to keep preaching the gospel and teaching the Word of God every day, so we don't have to handle it. Verse 5, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose. So, so the people chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. So the church people came together. They said, I know, we know some men, and they, they picked some men. They brought these men before the congregation. Then the church came and laid their hands on them and ordained these men to take care of the business, take care of the money. Verse 7, And the word of God increased... And the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. Isn't that cool? When everything's in order, everybody has a place. You know, one of the things that you have to recognize is God has given you specific talents and gifts. And as I get to know every couple in this church, 
every husband and wife, I have discovered that God has uniquely paired some people together. And I could go through the families and say, well, in this family, the dad doesn't handle the money the mom does. You go to the next family and it's like, well, in this family, the dad's really sharp with the money and mom handles this area of the business. The Bible doesn't say whether the mom or the dad should handle the money, but the thing is we need to be good stewards, not just of our money, but also of our spiritual resources. And God brings people together to work together for His glory. And here we see in the church it's kind of the same way that God brings people to take care of certain details where they, they really excel. Did you know it's better to hire somebody to do the things you don't want to do? Seriously. Now, show of hands, who changes their own oil? Keep them up, keep them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These men are tradesmen that work with their hands. Who does not change their own oil? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right, that's me. You know why I don't change my oil? I have a lot of other things that I really feel my time is more valuable. And I would almost rather pay somebody to just take care of that for me so I can focus. So, so when you have a weakness, you should let somebody else handle that weakness and you should work in your strong suit. If it's nothing for you, I mean, you can look at a car going down the road and you can tell me what kind of oil it has, how many gallons it has, what, what you have to do to do it. And you got the tools with you. I mean, you're the guy to change your oil. But if not, and you're like, all I know is it's about 50 bucks and they do it in 15 minutes and then I can get back to making money, because that, that makes me lose money. Well, then it's okay, right? We don't all have to change our oil. But there are different areas of your life, and maybe it's the financial area. If you would go to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. I'm talking about how to be a spiritual millionaire, and I really don't want to talk a lot about money, but there's such a parallel here with what God's talking about. I just want to drive this thought home. If you will be faithful in the little things, the little actions, the little deeds, the little habits of your life, then God can use you to give you great blessings in those same areas. And that principle applies to every area of your life. When you get to Luke chapter 12, look at verse 42. Luke 12, verse 42, And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Do you know how you get caught working? It's a habit. You're not looking through, is the boss here? Okay, I can relax. Oh, is the boss here? No, I can still play around. No, it's your habit. I'm working. I'm working. I'm working. Oh, the ball showed up. Hey, what's going on? I'm, he sees you're working. He'll catch you working, right? Verse 44, of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. Go back to Luke 16 where we started. Go back to Luke chapter 16. Finally, look at verse number 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? I want to use this example of this guy that we met last night, the, the Hebrew Israelite guy. If I wasn't faithful to serve him and be merciful to him, I would not have had an opportunity to preach Jesus to him. He wouldn't have received it. I hope that those seeds that I planted, those small seeds, can be watered. We as Christians ought to have a reputation as being faithful because God is faithful. He's merciful. We should be merciful. He's loving. We should be loving. What are we doing with the little things, the little time, the little opportunities? If we're not faithful to others, they're not going to listen to us when we try to tell them how great God is. They're going to discount what we say. They'll treat it as nothing. Oh, who are you to talk about that? You're a hypocrite. You don't do anything right. 
Look at verse 12. And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in mammon. You can't serve God in money. You can't serve God in stuff. You can't serve God in career. There comes a point where you just have to say, Lord, you know that I need stuff to take care of my family, and I'm going to trust you to provide everything that I need as I work for you. When I get up and go, I'm going to serve you. And when I minister to my family, I'm going to serve you. Instead of being so focused, I can't lose every nigga, oh, i got to get the money, money, money. You just say, stop, change my mind. Work for the Lord. Work for the Lord. Serve Him in my heart, and God will take care of the other details. When you're working, when you have that type of attitude that you're faithful in every little thing as if God's looking over your shoulder to see how well you do, then God will give you great riches, both here and there. He'll take care of the details. No servant can serve two masters. Look at verse 14. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. Why? Because they love their stuff. Verse 15, and he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. He kind of drives it home. Jesus is preaching to the Pharisees. They had the wealth, and they also had a spiritual reputation of being holy. As far as most men could see and tell, they were doing things the right way. They were obeying the laws. But in their heart, there was a big problem. And God says, God knoweth your heart. Look at it in verse 15. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. When we get to heaven, we are not going to be able to tell God how much money we made. He will not care. He is not interested in that. He is interested in the true riches. And the only way for us to get the true riches are to be faithful in the little things. How are you doing on the little things? What area of your life are there some little things that you kind of need to tighten up a little? Need to get a little better at? Go to Luke 19 and we'll finish there. Go to Luke chapter 19. Look at verse number 17. Luke 19, 17, the Bible reads, And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. There is spiritual treasure that we cannot comprehend. And when we cross the path when we leave this world and we enter into the spiritual when we go to heaven when we see Jesus Christ at the judgment seat and we're rewarded as he ushers in his kingdom as he eventually sets up a new heaven and a new earth and we understand spiritual things from spiritual eyes we're going to probably have some regrets oh if only I had made a serious effort at being faithful at the little things then I could be like the great men of faith in the past that God has given huge blessings to, He says, have thou authority over ten cities. God wants you to have authority with Him in eternity. And it's upside down. The things that this world, where they say it's great, God calls it an abomination. If you want to know what God calls an abomination, just go to Google and say, what's trending? Right? What's trending? And God says, oh, that's an abomination. It's like it's upside down. Have you heard this song? Have you seen this thing? Oh, there's a new challenge. That's an abomination to God. That's not what we're here for. That's not what our body's for, our mind's for, our time. Our friends ought to be spiritual friends. Our time should be invested in spiritual things. How are you doing on the little things? Let's get to work on the little things, and then God will give us great riches, true riches. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much. And Lord, I just pray that you would use some of these verses to compel us, to motivate us, to help us reevaluate our lives and to see what we're doing with what you've given us. Lord, we know that time is short. A whole lifespan here is nothing compared to eternity. 
Lord, I do pray that you would continue to raise up the children out of this church to serve you and be the next generation of great Christians in your eyes. And we humbly ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.